As the fifth generation of the console war raged across living rooms all over the world, one player was oddly absent. Sega with their Saturn and Sony with their PlayStation battled for control of the market. Sony, the newcomer to the console market, having supplied parts to the consoles of past generations, now entered the fray and wanted all the glory for itself. With a system that not only had the full and undivided support of the Sony Corporation, but growing support amongst third-party developers. Sega entered the war with the Saturn, a system that was powerful but expensive. But Sega blundered in many ways with the launch of the console, resulting in a chain of events that alienated retailers and Sega's third-party support, which had the end result of Sony absolutely mopping the floor with Sega in North America. However, during all this, Nintendo was absent from the brawl. Contrary to the Nintendo we know today, Nintendo was once on the bleeding edge of gaming technology. Their consoles were often the benchmark by which the industry was measured. The fifth generation of consoles was such a moment for Nintendo, when they chose to release a system that was more powerful than their primary competitors, in terms of unadulterated 3D support. The war for control of the living room had raged since the 1970s, with the first batch of home consoles vying for a place of honor below the family television. The console wars, as they were later dubbed, became a mainstay of the global entertainment industry as new home game systems entered the fray hoping to cement themselves as the must-have product. The company Nintendo had come into the American market with amazing force and cemented themselves as an unstoppable juggernaut, marketing a game system that just about every family in America had to have. Despite there being other forces in the market, Nintendo pretty much had free range of the American video game industry from 1985 to 1989, when other forces like Sega and NEC entered the fight. NEC fell out quickly, with Sega holding their own, starting a marketing war almost unlike anything seen before it, with the console war going into full overdrive, as the Sega Genesis waged a war against Nintendo's profits. Nintendo was slow to adjust. They relied on their ailing NES, a system that had done well in the second half of the 1980s. If it wasn't for the pressure from the Sega Genesis, Nintendo would have been perfectly happy leaning on the NES for longer. The Genesis was starting to eat into Nintendo's North American profits, so Nintendo responded with the Super Nintendo, a system that once out of the gate basically cemented itself instantly in the American living room. The Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo were the two main players in North America, with both consoles waging a war for the hearts and minds of American children and their parents' checkbooks. The two consoles dominated the market. New systems would enter the fight, showing new trends in gaming with the addition of full 3D options that were visually impressive but that often came with a hefty price tag, dramatically slowing their adoption rate throughout much of the early 1990s. But it wasn't until the year 1994 that the main focus of the home console market shifted more towards 3D. It had been slowly moving in that direction, but for the big two, Sega and Nintendo, that was the year Sega launched the Saturn, a system that had its eyes on dominating the 3D market with its new tech. Only that wasn't to be. Sony, a massive Japanese corporation, had been eyeing the video game space for some time. After the Saturn hit the market, Sony entered the fight with their new 3D powerhouse, the PlayStation. Which, the PlayStation, for a scrappy newcomer, absolutely demolished the Saturn in just about every sales metric in North America. Sega was being beaten to a pulp by Sony in North America, yet one company was shockingly absent from the fight. Nintendo was late to the console war. Nintendo's leap into the next gen. Nintendo, unlike Sony and Sega, were late because the technology they wanted to use for their next system simply wasn't ready. The company Silicon Graphics was Nintendo's key in the development of the next generation system. Silicon Graphics, or SGI as they later rebranded themselves, was a trailblazer in the world of 3D graphics. Their workstations were legendary for their capabilities in generating 3D graphics for all manner of media, along with their equally legendary price tags. 
SGI wanted to secure their company's future beyond just making high-end workstations, and they wanted to approach the consumer space. And there was really no better option than to land their hardware in a major game console. SGI and Nintendo had a working relationship going back before 1992, with Nintendo and SGI working on 3D exhibits for their CES displays. These displays showcased a 3D Mario that could morph into all manner of item, but also the 3D model was capable of responding in real time to audience members. Those displays even landed Mario a signature voice, portrayed by Charles Martinet. But all those displays were powered by a Silicon Graphics 420BGX workstation. The graphics technology behind those displays ended up launching an entire system where it would be used for trade shows and on television. The people behind the adaptation of that technology predicted that home game systems would be the next step, and probably were only two to three years out from 1992. Ironically, Steve Glenn from Sim Graphics stated he thought the technology would cost as little as $200 to $400 for a home system, and in the end, he wasn't that far off. HDI did do something truly revolutionary for the time. They managed to take their knowledge of graphically intensive workstations and turn it into a consumer product that was not only ahead of its primary competition in terms of graphical power, but at a lower price point. HDI had made huge moves into the computer graphics market, with major motion pictures adopting their technology. But that would only take the company so far. A niche like CGI and films wouldn't allow the company to expand as dramatically as Jim Clark wanted. He knew consumer products and adapting their existing technology to fit that market was the best way forward. In addition to our current customer base, obviously, the people who have been using SGI machines and really needed the 3D graphics performance are going to look at this as, as, as a finally an ability to kind of spread these things throughout the workplace because of the, the lower cost of purchase for, for an express uh, capable system. SGI began looking for a company that could work with them in their technology. Famously, SGI offered their tech to Sega, but Sega was said to have wanted their tech on an exclusive basis, which wasn't tenable for SGI. It's even said they had offered their tech up to Trip Hawkins, but Trip was already too deep in development of the 3DO with his own technology, so we turned SGI away. SGI shopped their technology to a number of potential suitors, but many of these companies approached were too far along with their own designs to take SGI up on their new technology. Nintendo, however, was in the perfect position to take SGI up on their offer, and they already had a working relationship. SGI had a history of working within the game space Nintendo offered. The company Rare used SGI workstations to do pre-rendered 3D within the Donkey Kong Country titles. Those titles are often credited as giving the Super Nintendo a second wind and allowing the system to finally push past the Sega Genesis towards the end of that system's lifespan. The SGI workstations at Rare were proof that SGI seriously had something to offer to the game space, especially when it came to the emerging 3D game frontier. Once Nintendo and SGI started talking, the deal started to take shape. Nintendo, like other Japanese companies historically, worked with other Japanese companies for their hardware development needs. As Nintendo wanted to take back their market share from Sega and the newcomer Sony, Nintendo saw the potential reward because what SGI was offering at the time was above anything else being offered on the market. So the potential risk of alienating Japanese hardware manufacturers was well worth any fallout Nintendo might encounter. 2D to reality. The deal between SGI and Nintendo hit at a crucial time for Nintendo, as Nintendo themselves had started to work with 3D games on their own, working with Argonaut Software. That partnership led to the creation of a cartridge-based device that boosted the graphical performance of the Super Nintendo, allowing for more complex 3D creations. The FX chip was a direct result of the Argonaut partnership, which led to the creation of Star Fox, a game that now needs no introduction. Star Fox at the time was an innovative 3D title. Nintendo used much of the knowledge gained from that endeavor to expand their own understanding of 3D gaming and where the medium would ultimately go. Most notably, Shigeru Miyamoto keeping an eye on those projects and getting ready himself for what was next. Nintendo, even went as far as holding back titles like Star Fox 2 from release on the Super Nintendo, so they could move the franchise directly to the new 64-bit platform. Nintendo and SGI began working very closely with one another in the early phases of the new console's development. Nintendo engineers would go to SGI offices for a couple of days, where an employee from SGI, Van Hook, would explain 3D graphics to them. It wasn't long before Van Hook got drafted into the new 64-bit war. 
The SGI VP I worked for asked me to spend a couple days explaining 3D graphics to visiting Nintendo engineers, says Van Hook, after which they apparently drafted me to architect what would become the N64, the history of how we play. The general feeling across the industry was that Silicon Graphics couldn't do it. There was no way the company famous for its groundbreaking 3D graphics workstations, with their even more legendary price tags, could take that expensive technology and turn it into something as affordable as a game system that could go into a child's bedroom without an associated mortgage payment. But on August 23rd, 1993, Nintendo and SGI introduced the public to Project Reality, a joint press conference held at the Mark Hopkins Hotel in San Francisco. The two companies showed the world the plans the two companies had for the future. SGI's express goal was to bring their technology to the home for under $250, and Nintendo's was to bring 3D gaming to a wider audience. The event showcasing Project Reality showed tech demos where 2D Mario characters were superimposed on 3D street scenes. Even the 3D Mario head made an appearance. Like many other eras in gaming, there was a lot of overpromising, with Nintendo stating they were the very first true 64-bit processor, equating that how Project Reality would dissolve the current limits of video play, and that it would challenge the notion of what a video game can be. With statements like that, many in the industry were rightfully skeptical, with others noticing that Nintendo didn't mention anything about the system's multimedia capabilities, leading to some observers thinking Nintendo's system wouldn't stand a chance against the likes of the 3DO a new system that approached the game licensing market differently, along with a focus on CD technology. The game space in the early 1990s was truly an open field for new contenders joining the fray. Nintendo, although warm and cuddly on its outward appearance, has always been cold and calculated. If there wasn't an achievable bottom line that resulted in Nintendo's favor, Project Reality wouldn't have become a reality. Nintendo had experience making games and developing them on SGI's platforms. So, with that experience in mind, Adapting that technology to a console wasn't necessarily that far of a stretch. What wasn't yet decided was the medium the console would use. The notion that cartridges were always the choice for Nintendo wasn't necessarily true. There was a period of time when Nintendo was strongly considering using disc-based media for the console, but would often shift back and forth on the pros and cons of both formats. With disc media, you had a dramatic increase in space offered for storage, but that came with a drawback of physical CD drives which added potential cost increases to consoles along with dreaded load times, which played console of that era. But Nintendo was drawn to quick access load times provided by cartridges. Along with the more secure nature of the medium, cartridges offered dramatically more control over the console than CD disc media could provide. CD piracy, although in its infancy, was still a growing concern for the industry. But historically, Nintendo had made massive amounts of money off selling cartridges. This was mainly due to the fact with cartridges, Nintendo controlled their manufacturer and made massive margins on their sale. So Nintendo's ultimate decision to go with cartridges wasn't based on pushing the bleeding edge of technology and more in line with the most cost-effective and profitable path forward for the console. But Nintendo did leave the idea of a later attachment that could expand the system's capabilities. Defining Reality What occurred between Nintendo and SGI was a growing relationship where the two companies began to work very closely with one another in their goal to finalize the console. Once SGI got the contract to build the system, they put out a call to all the engineers across the company to come work on it. Many SGI engineers have been working on the Unix systems, so the idea of doing something different certainly drew in talented individuals interested in a new challenge. What resulted was a team comprised of some of the best engineers that SGI had to offer. Within three to four months, the team working on the project grew to 50 personnel, a wide berth of talent ranging from folks specializing in graphics software, graphics processor design, audio software, CPU hardware design, and tools and OS systems. It was a perfect storm of talent, leading to a team of developers who were said to have worked together really well. In 1994, SGI knew the graphics they were showing off in their tech demos for Nintendo's console it wasn't possible for Twitter to our price point. The project had to face reality and set constraints on what realistically was possible at that price point. The engineers at SGI made their best guess when considering constraints and moved forward with and assumed any major errors or omissions would be worked out by the future optimizations of the platform. A great deal of design choices, like selecting a CPU and memory for the system, were not based on technical requirements, but based on those that were best suited for the business side of development. 
With the established constraints and design choices somewhat locked in, the team at SGI worked diligently to create the hardware and development software for the device. SGI worked to create a partnership with Rambus and Multigen Inc. Rambus for the RAM and Multigen for the support tools they would need to create a 3D development software and the often heard but not seen audio creation tools. Nintendo worked the manufacturing angle and started working with NEC to do chip production. Nintendo also reached out to Nichiman Graphics for support tools. Building Reality Nintendo historically has always wanted to find the best ways to save on manufacturing costs, going as far as to reduce the number of screws in a cartridge to save money. The Nintendo 64 was no different in Nintendo's history. Nintendo didn't ask or call for any major revisions during the console's development, but they did however look for ways to cut down on the overall cost. Nintendo would look for anything to cut on cost. Nintendo with things like the number of pins on a chip lowered to the least amount possible without losing performance. As one pin on a ship could cost two cents, that number seems small, but after building 50 million units, that one pin cost Nintendo one million dollars. But there was a limit to how far that could go, as most of the pins have to be there. As far as game creation for the platform was coming at this point, there was really no set standard, so many developers were forced, much like the SGI engineers were forced, to make their best estimates on what the ultimate performance and capabilities of the system would be. Ironically, the first game made for Project Reality, Killer Instinct, didn't use any of the hardware from Project Reality. But Killer Instinct in itself was a marketing stunt to draw attention to the new console by toting arcade graphics in the home. The Onyx system SGI offered at roughly $100,000 on the low end could do simulations of the Reality Engine, which gave developers the ability to simulate the system in software before the actual hardware became available. I don't know much about what the developers actually did, Webb admits. Some of them, including Rare, came into our office during development to give us feedback on what they wanted to do or needed for debugging. Richard Webb. SGI started touting how their new low-end SGI Indigo machines would be very well suited for game development for the new console, with those workstations having roughly power comparable to that of the system's final specs. But actual game development began at Nintendo. SGI directed Nintendo's attention to a company called Paradigm Simulation, a company that was already making games off the SGI workstations. Sugiro Miyamoto started splitting attention between internal development in Nintendo and Paradigm Simulation. Paradigm was seen as a company that knew how to push the limits of the workstations. The team at Paradigm started making what would eventually become Pilotwings 64. They didn't even know the system's final specs until halfway through the development of the title. This became somewhat of a running theme among early Nintendo 64 development. But nonetheless, the team pushed forward, making software for the system. The team at Paradigm worked closely with SGI, helping SGI flush out many of the system's intricacies. The team at Paradigm really pushed the system's limits and really helped get the system where it needed to be before SGI finalized the development boards. The 64-Bit Bluff In January of 1995, Nintendo announced that they had the chipset for the now-named Ultra 64 done and ready. This, however, wasn't true. Nintendo announced this mainly because of the pressure from the industry around their tardiness to the new console war, and that the Sony PlayStation and Sega Saturn were now out in stores. Nintendo only had the aging Super Nintendo and the soon-to-be-released Virtual Boy, still making the company's presence known. So Nintendo wanted to say something that made them relevant, at least in the short term. However, only four months later, Nintendo would announce that the official public unveiling of the console would be pushed back to the Space World event in Japan. That was an event for Japanese wholesale distributors. The North American dates would also be pushed back. The reasons for the delay of the Ultra 64 are not tacked onto any singular issue. However, the delays can be attributed to a lack of games being ready for launch. Many of the game developers were still stuck in a bit of a limbo waiting on the official specs of the system to be finalized to really start full production on their titles. There are other statements from the era that claim the delay is linked to SGI's chips not meeting the desired performance and having to undergo a redesign. But also SGI was going into a bit of a shakeup with their senior leadership at the time. But whatever the ultimate reason for the Ultra's delay, the system was functional by mid-1995. Navigating Reality 
Physical console designs of the mid-1990s hit a wall with their designs, as most consoles embraced the CD as their primary means of media. The PlayStation and Saturn both took relatively square boxy designs as a result, but Nintendo wanted something a tad more elegant. A square, but with more exaggerated curves. But the main difference between the Ultra and the primary competitors was that it had four controller ports, a sign of the console's multiplayer ambitions. The physical design of the system was set pretty early on in the console's life, with Nintendo revealing the console design in the second quarter of 1994. The controller, however, was something that a great deal of consideration was put into its design. 3D was at that time a pretty new frontier in terms of the home console space. Not many controllers took advantage of what 3D was in the game space. The controller, although a tad alien now, was a logical step in terms of approaching 3D, with it literally forcing players to isolate parts of their hand on the controller in order to access the 3D elements. There was no real set standard to 3D controllers at that time, so the controller reflects that. The controller both benefited and suffered from this approach. It offered a wide variety of ways to approach 3D controls, and worked well when done right. But if a developer didn't find the right way to utilize the controller and its unique qualities, the experience certainly suffered. It was said Nintendo went through over 100 prototypes before landing on the finalized design. The addition of an analog stick on the controller for the first time in a mainstream console since the Atari 5200 was the greatest addition to the 3D controls. The analog stick designed by Genoi Takeya added a massive advantage for players to maneuver in a 3D space. It also introduced self-centering, which was a crucial addition to the technology. Because with the past analog sticks, it did not self-center and the player would just keep moving in a direction. With the addition of self-centering, the player could stop and change direction and orientation at an instant, dramatically improving the gameplay experience. A three-pronged design is credited to Lance Barr, who figured the design would allow for comfort while affording players different approaches and grips for 3D control. The controller also added something else that was new. It added a port that allowed for peripherals to be plugged in. It also acted as a gateway for memory cards to be used for the system and save game progress, and also the addition of a rumble pack at a later time. The new controllers were a far reach from the first prototypes, which were just Super Nintendo controllers with a primitive joystick and Z button added. Nintendo's Dream Team Nintendo had selected an elite group of developers nicknamed Nintendo's Dream Team, who were the first to start working on games for the system. The teams were Silicon Graphics, Alias Research, Software Creations, Rambus, Multigen, Rare, WMS Industries, Acclaim Entertainment, Williams Entertainment, Paradigm Simulation, Spectrum Holobyte, DMA Design, Angel Studios, Ocean, Time Warner Interactive, and Mindscape. The team started work using the Onyx Silicon Graphics workstations with the Reality Engine 2 graphics boards. The use of these systems allowed for game developers to start work on games even before the console was finalized as the Onyx system could replicate the estimated system performance of the Nintendo console. The Onyx systems were said to have been so accurate that once the system specs were finalized on the Nintendo 64, porting the prototype of a LucasArts title only took three days to port it over to the actual console. Once the development kits based on the indie workstations were finished, they were shipped out to the Dream Team members and other developers. The dev kits were sourced through Kyoto Microcomputer, as well as Nintendo's Intelligent System team. Most developers would get a computer board and an extra tall development cartridge, and the ports for the controller when those were finally finished. With the creation of a game development environment for game developers, oftentimes console makers would just send out massive books of system documentation, which made the process of entry a bit steep. But Nintendo and Silicon Graphics made sure to include a host of demonstration software to get developers started without the same dramatic learning curve. Programming by this console generation had started to move away from assembly and started to focus on the C programming language. That shift dramatically lowered the requirements to entry in terms of game and software development. The system had both as a possible approach to game creation. C, however, was becoming the dominant language. The move to the realm of 3D game creation put dramatically more of a lead time on game development. The developers who committed early to Nintendo were looking at potentially years before their games could release. Nintendo helped quell fears by giving massive amounts of support to the developers who locked in with them. Even Silicon Graphics was locked in to support companies developing games on the system. The developers even got access to Nintendo's Mario Club, who were Nintendo's internal testing group. 
who would give the devs early input on their games, along with massive amounts of face-to-face -face support. Nintendo was committed to support companies making games for the console. Folks at LucasArts stated that they were very lucky to receive support from not only Nintendo, but also from Silicon Graphics. All of Nintendo's game makers were working hard on releasing a product they could be proud of. Reality to Ultra to 64 All the mass amounts of work were building to a singular thing, the release of the Ultra 64, which by this point in the system's life, that tag had been dropped and the system was simply became branded the Nintendo 64. The dropping the Ultra label might have been linked to the fact that Konami owned the rights to Ultra games, so there might have been some kind of legal issue there that prevented Nintendo from using the Ultra moniker. But Nintendo stated the change to Nintendo 64 allowed for a singular focus on a global brand. The name Nintendo 64 was suggested by Earthbound creator Shigesato Otoi. The NUS tag on the model and software is a reference to the console's original name, Nintendo Ultra 64. The finish line was finally in sight. Space World 1995, a trade show that was originally selected to be the launch date for the Nintendo 64, was unfortunately not that. It became an event where the Japanese retailers, press, and public got to view the system really for the first time. The system had been announced, but only the main takeaway was that the system would be delayed into 1996, with the Japanese release hoping to hit around April 21st, 1996, with the North American launch landing shortly after. However, the Japanese launch in reality wouldn't really happen until June of 1996, with the North American launch happening in September. The main reason for the delay is mostly credited to Mario 64 only being half finished. Nintendo wanted Mario to be a launch title, as the plumber had helped carry past Nintendo systems to success. Only two demos were available to play at the event. Mario 64, which was a partial build of the game but still ultimately impressed players, and Kirby Ball 64, which Kirby Ball would never actually release on the N64, but Space World showcased the software for the system and showed that the system had an impressive lineup of titles that were going to come out. With games like Zelda 64, Mario Kart R, Blast Dozer, Body Harvest, and Wave Race 64 being announced, which looked like an impressive selection of titles for the new console. Launch Nintendo finally solidified their launch date. They set the official launch date for June 23, 1996 in Japan. The system sold very well, with 350,000 to 500,000 units moving in three days. The day had finally come, and Nintendo managed to release their system. This, after three years of hard work and development, Nintendo even managed to keep it at the promised price point of 25,000 yen, or roughly $230. The Nintendo 64 managed that price point by not having a pack-in game. Mario 64 was available at launch, along with Pilot Wings and a Shogi title, but that only came out in Japan. Those games sold around $60 apiece. Nintendo's lean lineup of games can be credited simply to the fact that 3D games were harder to make. Many developers were struggling. Nintendo is said to have had been more than generous in letting developers delay their games to refine their product. Nintendo, in terms of game creation, at least in the early stages of a console, had always been quality over quantity. Mario 64 is often credited as being a revolutionary title for how it implemented 3D controls, and had the gameplay emphasis being on exploring the 3D environment over traditional gameplay objectives. Mario 64 is a massive title that is considered by many to be a masterpiece of game design. As such, despite it being a massive part of history of the Nintendo 64, it won't be explored in much depth in this video, as others have done the title to much greater fanfare. You see, the Nintendo 64 weeded out weaker developers at an early stage. In the long term, I think that was necessary. Almost a rite of passage. Shigeru Miyamoto, Nintendo. Video games, the more bits, the better, and the new machine from Nintendo is as good as it gets. It's the new Nintendo 64. So what's the big deal, and why is Toys R Us already sold out? Nintendo's launch in North America was a smashing success, with demand for the system far exceeding the supply of units available. Up until the launch of the unit, there was a gray market, with import stores charging close to $700 per console. The console's original price tag of $250 was dropped down to $199 to put the system more in line with the PlayStation 1 and Saturn, respectively. The North American launch was backed by up to $54 million in marketing. 
daunting reality. Nintendo faced a bit of an uphill battle with the N64, having a limited launch library and the company's decision to delay the system. And the choice of cartridges made companies like Squaresoft drift away from Nintendo in favor of larger storage formats and the much wider install base of the PlayStation. Nintendo's former dominance of the Japanese home console market was no longer the hegemonic force it once was. The PlayStation and Saturn had a good standing in the Japanese market, so Nintendo could no longer pull the strings of those retail chains the same way it once could. So it had to play fair. They partnered with the retail store chain Lawson, which wasn't as strong a partnership as Nintendo had hoped. Nintendo also faced a bit of a shock when longtime Nintendo employee and engineer Gunpo Yokoi left the company. That event caused a shockwave that dropped Nintendo's stock value in August of 1996. Nintendo up until that point had taken a few hits, but the company was still moving forward with the launch. The showing at E3 1996 was strong, despite the system only having two games initially. The system sold out constantly the first year. Even with setbacks, Nintendo still managed to sell 3.6 million units, with 5.8 million units being sold in 1997. Despite those numbers looking very healthy for Nintendo, Sony still had a principal advantage of a larger install base of systems and already having sorted out their supply problems. So they were outperforming Nintendo despite the N64's promising start. Nintendo 64, despite being among the most capable systems of that generation when it came to 3D gaming, had a massive uphill battle to dethrone the PlayStation. Nintendo would ultimately lose out in the fight and not surpass the PlayStation with the N64 in terms of units sold. Nintendo was said to have missed the mark in a number of areas. Namely, their marketing was just considered uncool for the time at least initially. It wasn't until later the console's life that the commercials for the platform got more risky and experimental. Sony kept in the vein of Sega and stayed with the edgy marketing that seemed to work well in the early to mid-1990s. Bleeding Edge. The Nintendo 64, despite its relative revolution in support for 3D gaming, the N64 didn't return Nintendo to its once unshakable position as the undisputed hegemon of household console gaming. It did, however, keep Nintendo relevant in the gaming space. That was now changed forever, with the introduction of new consoles and new players to the game space. New challenges and struggles were on the horizon, and the gaming industry now entering its third decade of existence was again changing with the times and the pace of technology. Despite losing an overall games and systems sold, the Nintendo 64 remains alive in the minds and hearts of many gamers. The games released on that platform are remembered as timeless classics, and that is even when looked back upon with less than favorable controllers. Games like Mario 64 and The Legend of Zelda series have found new life on that platform, and those games' versions have been ported and remade to just about every future Nintendo console without fail because of their timeless approach to 3D gaming. But also, the games themselves are among the best titles ever created. Games like GoldenEye took an almost forgotten film tie-in and turned it to one of the most revered FPS console games of all time. The console's native four-player multiplayer made it a system that was open to more players. It wasn't just a four-player peripheral that only a select few had. Everyone with a Nintendo 64 could have four people sit down and play it all at once. Playing GoldenEye four-player back in the 90s of a sleepover will always cement the N64 in my mind as one of the greatest console experiences of all time. But thank you for watching the Stork Nerd. Hi, thanks for watching Sword Nerd today. I want to thank you for making it to the end of the video. But I want to put out some special thanks to uh, Shadow Mask for his musical contributions to the video, along with individuals for lending their voice talents and reading quotes for the video. That'd be Bob from Retro RGB, Yahel from Wrestles Gaming, and Stika. Thank you, all of you, for assisting in the video. But I also want to thank you in the audience who participated in the community polls I put out before this video launched. So, to start that, we had 102 votes 
that went into our, what was your favorite console from the fifth generation of the console wars? And leading that pack was the Sony PlayStation at 46% of the 102 votes, followed neck and neck by the Sega Saturn and Nintendo 64 at 24%, and then the Atari Jaguar and 3DO, with the Jaguar just barely beating out the 3DO with 1%, sitting at 4% of the vote. And then the final poll I did before the launch of this video was the, what was your favorite game out of the top five best-selling Nintendo 64 games? Out of those, Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time won out with 33% of the vote, with 60, per, with 60 individuals voting in this poll. Then we was followed by Super Mario 64, 28%, followed by GoldenEye at 25, then Mario Kart at 10%, and then Super Smash at 3%, which is interesting, because I would have thought Smash Brothers would have scored higher, but that's just kind of interesting. But I want to thank you guys for watching. Have a great day, evening, or night, or whatever you're doing. Bye.